and that's that the people and their elected legislators would have notice and an opportunity to study things and discuss them before they get implemented in a policy law. And I just want to want to step through uh, just a few steps of that. Uh, so this idea of national standards was around for a while. Uh, 2006, 2007, it, it was being kept alive by the, among others, the Hunt Institute <laughs> in North Carolina. They reached out to the Gates Foundation and brought them on board with the effort. The Gates Foundation started funding the National Governors Association and Council of Chief State School offered some on the effort. And uh, prior to 2009, had spent in the, in the realm of about $35 million. This was not for standards development. This was for st uh, strategy, developing strategies and setting the groundwork for implementation. Um, and it's important to note that, that through 2008, the governors themselves had not voted on this, uh, but even if they had, the National Governors Association, as the resolution uh, indicates, is a private trade organization. It has no grant of authority from the states. In other words, it has no grant of authority from the people. So this isn't state-led. So uh, they developed this plan, and it's laid out in, in a document they published called Benchmarking for S Success. They they convinced the incoming Obama administration to adopt this plan. So this wasn't a hijack of an effort. This was a partnership. And um, then the Obama administration got it in, embedded in the 2009 stimulus bill, a $4.35 billion grant. Uh, about a week after the stimulus bill was, was used, uh, it, it was a $4.35 billion that gave the department a lot of discretion on how to spend it. So a week later, C-SPAN asked Arnie Duncan, what are you going to do with this money? And he said, well, I, I really like the work in, of the, the National Governors Association and Gates in working to bring about national standards. And he said he wanted to be the catalyst to make that happen. And then, you know, to, then he hired two uh, top-level officials from the Gates Foundation, including someone in his Office of Innovation and Improvement, the director of that, and his, his chief of staff. Uh, so then the, the race to the top was, um, was announced. The, the National Governors Association finally took a vote, and you read the, the uh, press description of the vote, it said it was a, it was a cursory vote, uh, very little discussion. Um, and as I said once again, uh, we, you know, we don't know who the governors were that were there, uh, but there was no debate anyway, and we don't even have that resolution. Um, but, it, but by that time, the administration had already signaled that, that it favored the, uh, what the National Governors Association was doing. Uh, it favored it in relation to the race to the top money. So the states at this time were under a lot of, of fiscal pressure. They were told by the administration, uh, you better get the stimulus money, you better get as much of it as possible, or you're going to have to lay off hundreds of thousands of teachers. <laughs> the uh, administration announced the, the program, trying to do this very quickly. Uh, the first round of applications were due in January uh, 2010. Now in the applications, the states had to commit to the Common Core. Well, one slight problem, um, the standards hadn't been written yet. Yep. Right. It, it, this program fell under a, a constitutional principle called, we have to pass it before we find out what's in it. Okay, I'll, I'll finish this in a, in a minute in deference to my, my colleagues. They, they, in um, March 2010, the first draft of the Common Core came out. Uh, June 1, 2010, the second round of Race to the Top applications were due, which more states committed to the Common Core. June 2, 2010, the final draft of the Common Core was released. 
And then the states had two months in which to fulfill their commitments by formally adopting the standards, which means they had to sit down, evaluate the Common Core, compare them to their own standards, uh, pilot study the Common Core, because no one else had done that, and no one else ever did it. Uh, look at the evidence on which they were, were based, and um, I'm trying to think what else would need to be done. Perhaps give notice to the legislature, the people's representatives, since this was being marketed as transforming the education of every child in America. And what else? Uh, perhaps give notice to the people themselves. All that had to be done between June and August 2nd, 2010. So that gets to the point of, well, why didn't people, why are people just now discussing this? The constitutional construct, the idea of a compound republic, of federal government and state governments, is meant to protect the engagement of the people, the discussion of the people, it's meant to preserve the idea of self-directed government. It's not meant to evade it, which is what was done in this case. because it's been mentioned that it was well debated and publicly very well known, it was publicized in the papers. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people here read about the adoption prior or at the time of adoption back in, I'm guessing, 2010? Anyone? A few of you? Okay. Well, that, that was what we found in Indiana, so I, I was just surprised to know it was well publicized here. Um, but I, since I, I'd like to say to you, uh, you know, your position seems to be that if you had had, you know, better standards, you perhaps would have adopted the Common Core um, and that, you know, you would be concerned. And I'm here to tell you, you should be concerned. Uh, because the issue of the fuzzy map, which I started out with, that is very different. And I'm not an expert on Ohio's former standards, um, so you all may know otherwise. But in Indiana, our old standards didn't <laughs> dictate. They didn't contain uh, pedagogy. Um, as the Common Core does. So if you liked the fuzzy math, if your school and you ch chose to do the fuzzy math, fine. If you didn't and you liked more traditional math, you could do that. The Common Core standards does contain fuzzy math, math pedagogy in the uh, practice standards. It does. Um, and that is why you're seeing so many textbooks, even Saxon math, being rewritten um, in ways that would shock you. When I read a sample problem from Saxon on their new Common Core line math book for third grade, and I just randomly clicked on it, the first thing that came up said, students will get in groups and act out the problem, then they will move on to drawing pictures of the problem. I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd see those words in a Saxon math textbook. But regarding the math standards, um, they are not high quality, internationally benchmarked. Um, after we uh, looked at what Professor Milgram had to say about it, we also looked at um, what some of the people on the feedback committee. So there was a validation committee and there was a common core feedback committee where uh, you know people put suggestions, it was basically like a suggestion box. They never got together and met. It was a you know, call in and give us your feedback. And one of the people that served on that was um, Dr. Fabio Milner, a professor um, who was at Purdue University but is now at Arizona State University. And he um, sent us a letter with his opinions, and I, I won't read the whole thing, but the final sentence says, I can unequivocally recommend that Indiana not adopt the Common Core math standards if the state wants to require high school graduates from the state to excel by design to a higher level than average. Is that what you want here in Ohio, average? Because that's not what I want. And further uh, validating that notion, um, Jason Zimba, the writer of the Mass Standards himself, has publicly testified that by design, the Common Core Mass Standards were to prepare students for a two-year non-select community college, not a four-year university. So this notion that these are, you know, high standards that are going to just shoot us, you know, to the top is simply wrong, and it's a myth. Um, All right, well then I, I will just go ahead and hand it to Joy. Um, but again, i just like to say the, the biggest problem with this is when you have a problem, the distance between the parent and the child in the classroom and those who can fix it is now outside the state of Ohio. 
They are owned and copyrighted. They cannot be edited, changed, or deleted. Not one word. I think that's a problem. <laughs> Foundation and it, 
in particular then it was developed by a group called Achieve Inc., um, which is a uh, entity, a uh, private entity that's governed by, um, it was created by, kind of by the National Governors Association. There's three governors who sit on the board and then three corporate executives who sit on the board. Um, so it gets back to this very much a corporate-driven, foundation-driven effort. I'd like to add, um, someone mentioned social standards studies, social studies standards. And um, they are developing social studies standards. The CCSSO is in the process, and Ohio is listed as one of the states involved in that. And when I found that out, I thought, well, I'll try to find out who's writing them. I called CCSSO, and I asked, could I please find out uh, the list of the individuals writing these standards? I thought I'd get a jump start on the front end rather than the back end. It is not available for public information. It is being done behind closed doors once again. And that is what happened with the writing of the math and the ELA standards. Kelly, Kelly's going to win. Hey, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not on the panel, but let me answer that. Um, now, this is my fourth year on the school board. Not for a second do they ask my opinion on curriculum. I've got two board members in here. In fact, if we ask a question about a textbook we're supposed to be adopting, we're told we're micromanaging. Yes. We're not being a good school board member. Absolutely. We're not playing the game. This is not up to your school board, trust me. When we ask financial questions, that's as far as we can go.
I'd like to quickly add about that. Dr. Sandra Stotsky, who wrote who had a large hand in writing Massachusetts Top in the Nation Standards, has created her own set of free and changeable standards that she's given release for any state to use. Um, so she's basically like, use my brain, use my expertise, do whatever you want with them. So at least half of the work would be done for you already. Vicki Rohold to come up. You guys are on that. Lee Hunter and Vicki Rohold. This is Wendy Seacrest from Kettering City Schools. Um, going on to the understanding that we can pick the curriculum. We've heard for years and years teachers teach to the test. Mm -hmm. So is that is a national test that the teachers are using now, or is it state run? And will the test date be the national test that we are going to that they, they will tend to teach to? There is no national test. The test that is used right now in Ohio is an Ohio test. We just scrapped an Ohio test, the Ohio graduation test. And we're going to have Ohio end of course exams as the basis of graduation. And we're going to have Ohio approved tests. Whatever test we run in the state will be one that is approved either by the state board or the legislature for achievement purposes. But for substance, you pick those tests. You and your local districts decide what is being assessed. And I assure you there's great variation in this state on the curricula used and the common core standards being adopted in this state do nothing to change them. Um, Governor Kasich has put into his budget a line item for the state to join park testing. That's one of the national tests. And when we say national, that basically means there's different you know, groups of some 20 states across the country and national unelected uh, bureaucrats creating those tests right now that are set to roll out for 2014-2015. So Ohio is online, uh, that at least the, the folks in government in Ohio are online to join the park consortium. They're in the park consortium. They, governors put the money in, the, in his budget for the tests. Um, that's the track that Ohio is on right now. And as I mentioned earlier, all the other tests, Iowa basic, uh, the SAT, ACT, those are all already aligned. And I'd, I'd also like to add um, that the park test is federally funded. It was created with federal funds. And the other problem that I don't think we've mentioned is that you will no longer control your cut score. Um, where your cut score is set, you are now ceding control to, you are now one of 22. Whereas before, you're one of one. Um, if they set it too low, you haven't solved any problems whatsoever. But we don't know where they're going Next to question is Lee Hunter, Worthington School District. Uh, this could be answered either by Mr. Jones or Mr. Brenner. I, I, I see that you all do have some concerns with this. And what I don't understand is why, and, and I think everybody here knows where this is headed. This is only just the beginning of where this is going to be taken. So I don't understand why you two want all of us to just roll over and play dead, give up, standards are bad. Why can't we come back now that we know what is going on? Why can't we stand up and change it and make Ohio better? Uh, there, absolutely. I, I think you should. Look, I'm sitting in the Ohio House Education Committee. Believe me. I know exactly what's going on on the other side of the aisle because they're there constantly pushing their ideas and ideology on everybody else. That's why when they went completely ballistic, when we passed Senate Bill 165 last year, put the founding documents actually in as a requirement to be taught. Um, but, you know, every one of them, I'm absolutely glad. You need to stand up and raise what for. You need to go to your local school boards. You need to go to your superintendents. You need to go and start raising what for. Write letters to the editor. I'm not. Do that. I'm in complete agreement. So, do you think that we could be better off as a state changing and making our standards better than the Board? I think Common Core is better. I think we could do other better means. We can have higher standards through other means. But the fact is, I want to see the alternative on the table. And I'll, I'll tell you, after being around Ohio politics for eight years and national politics for 15 before that, I want to remind you. People could talk a good game about this is what I'll vote for, but plenty of conservatives crumble under the pressure and they'll dumb down standards. You say I want high standards, people can do that till the cows come home. This man won't, but I assure you, folks will say that and then they'll undermine it as they go. I'm out here right now telling you I want high standards and I'm sticking by them. I'm not, I'm not elected, I'm an appointed official. We're a majority uh, elected board. 
Uh, but that's the reality. If you don't like it, talk to your elected officials and propose an alternative. Say what you want. Don't say I don't like the Common Core. Say here's what I want to do with the alternative. Let me, let me tell you this. Um, we had, I think, in the bill last year, Governor Casey had promoted because he really pushed it for a lot higher standards and a lot higher accountability. <laughs> we had a debate in the Education Committee, and this is coming from the educators, and not, a couple of these other representatives are from the other side of the aisle, and they were arguing about whether or not we should set some sort of minimum passing standards. The standards right now, I think, are so low that I think in the test, if you get 30%, you're passing. 35%, I, 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 my apologies, 35% in your passing. That's a disaster. Uh, I am sorry, but our side of the aisle, I'm going to tell you the Republicans, and even the Republicans, if you look at them from what they were coming from initially on this common forum, where Bill Gates, I mean, Bill Gates, I mean, talk about a capitalist. The only reason he's got a lot of money is because of capitalism and he raised it. He was so concerned about the United States of America falling behind every other country on the planet. And not just a little bit, we were getting blown out by all these other countries on the planet. Now, I would like to implement Milton Friedman style free market type based systems where you do have high standards, but let every student go to whatever school they choose because the free market will work. No, no, I don't think of Bill Gates as a capitalist, I think of him as a corporatist. Uh, the, the thing. The thing is, is I, I, I sense on, on the other side here, maybe there's some uh, openness to improve standards. And I think if you look at the Common Core and what it ushers in, it, it really is a bucket of junk. And maybe, uh, maybe they can start on a few places where they'd like to improve the Common Core. For instance, the trend in America uh, for the last 15 years or so was to put Algebra 1 into 8th grade, and then that allows a, a more comfortable uh, logical progression of, of math uh, up to, to, to get to calculus comfortably by 12th grade. Common Core puts Algebra 1 basically back into 9th grade, and then their rebuttal is, well, we have this accelerated program whereby you can get to to calculus by 12th grade. The problem with that, and California has the, the numbers to, to back that up, the, the, the problem with that is that when California, for instance, moved algebra one to eighth grade, what happened, there was a disproportionate rise in um, uh, children from low-income families who, got to, uh, who suddenly started getting a calculus in 12th grade. And the reason, for that is when, when you have that accelerated program, the people who are most able to uh, avail of that are those well-to-do families who can hire tutors uh, for summer courses and things of that nature. So there's a very, very profound equity uh, issue as to why Algebra 1 should be in eighth grade, why a state should reform its common core. We're going to go, you bring me Justin Smith, Jeremy Anderson, and Susie Needler. Come on up on deck. We've got Vicki Roholt from the Plain Local School District in Camp. Okay, um, I think a lot of people here are a little concerned with the direction of our government these days. And um, as we've seen, the federal government taking more and more control of our school, um, we've seen our international rankings go down and down continuously. When I was in school, we were right up there in the top 10, and now we're what, 26 out of 35 or something? But we're really low. So what we're doing is giving up our control of the school system, giving it to the federal government, which in times Questions, is, questions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get into that. Well, there was a, um, a, a probably an infamous quote that people all know about, he who owns the youth, gains the future. My question is, who determine, how do we know that the federal government in a changing world, how do we know that the federal government is going to make the right decisions on the uh, standards, whatever curriculum, curriculum you use to get to those standards is going to be the right one? Of course, the federal government, 
right, I keep saying this, the federal government is not deciding the standards. I, I, I know you don't believe that, but ultimately there is a point of approval, a point of final approval where we go into this, where the legislature agrees to, here's going to be the standard framework, and we as a state board implement, uh, set up those standards and implement them. As I've said, I believe the Common Core is going to break up before it reaches the finish line. It's going to do so, in my opinion, because I think some states are going to demand cut scores that are much lower than Ohio ones, and I'm one of the members pushing for higher standards. And the reason I'm doing that is that that is what is important. If that breaks apart the park, then we'll do something else. But we're going to have higher standards in this state. Governance of the standards is, is a problem, so says the Fordham Institute. So you have, you have the federal government uh, pushing, pushing the issue from, from the testing consortium. Then you have the standards which are owned by the National Governance Association Council of Chief State School Officers. So the, the Fordham Institute, let's just say really quickly, issued a report a couple of years ago saying, well, going forward we have to look at governance of the standards. Uh, so in, in the past, a state can sit down and, and make the decisions by themselves. But if you're in the Common Core system, then you have a collection of states. And for the report uh, said, well, you, you got that collection of states. Then you have the federal government and the private foundations. All of those are going to be uh, weighing in to, to govern the standards. Do we change them? Do we upgrade them? How do we validate them? Uh, and, and those pressures, we have precedent to see how that plays out, and that's how the Common Core itself was developed. Uh, the Forum Institute, I'll just read you that they came up with, they said there's a, three possible ways we could, we could govern, govern the standards. We could have a powerful centralized entity, which it could call, let's become more like France. We could have a, a small entity charged with updating the standards, but otherwise leaving these issues to be addressed as they arise. And they could have a, a middle ground, which uh, features an interim coordinated council that might evolve into something more permanent and ambitious um, over time. And that coordinated council is what they recommended. They said, well, we could have about maybe a, a dozen people on that. We could have uh, people from the federal government. We could have people from NGA, CCSSO. You know, um, they had a, a list of interest groups and associations that would have representation on it. And of course, uh, they didn't have, didn't suggest not one member from a state. So it's a huge problem going forward. Thank you very much. Next is Justin Smith, Fremont City Schools. My main question is for the supporters of this, uh, this is an unproven system. And I just want to know, why couldn't we have some districts try it out and see if it works rather than getting it signed in the whole state of Ohio? and do something that is totally unproven and created by individuals who do not necessarily have education experience or background. Well, districts are. I mean, districts have the ability, you right now have the ability to implement your own standards and push them. I know, I, I, like I said, we've got a local school board member here in this district, in this school district, who's doing it. But there's only one school board member. If, you're, if you get enough of your school board members to do that, raise your standards. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd get rid of the U.S. Department of Education. Well, you know, there are a lot 
Okay. There, there are a lot of things that are possessed by government that if misused could be problematic. You know, we have a large cache of weapons and defense equipment down here at the local National Guard Armory that theoretically could be turned on people. But that's not going to happen because we have a <laughs> Folks, that theoretically could be used on people, but it hasn't been. And, uh, you know, we go back to the Detroit riots, for example, when the National Guard was called out with Los Angeles riots. So I don't want to say never. But, but the responsibility of a government is internal vigilance. And putting, having data systems in place, they're already in place. And frankly, folks, if you believe that state data systems have a power of information over your children, then where are you about the, the broad uh, use of information in a commercial basis that's already adopted by the internet? How deeply do, and by the way, I am a deep opponent of centralized data systems, and I've done it throughout my career. I've been on the losing side for 15 years, but I'm also smart enough to recognize it's already a lot worse in the commercial realm. The data stored on this thing and this thing and your home computer tells more people more about you and your kids and your family than these state data systems ever, ever will. And all the, if you're worried about the government using it, they can tap those very same resources if that's what they desire. Uh, my, my question, or my answer would be, is you modify the Ohio Constitution. Uh, and you, you put an amendment out there like we've done in the past, and you put it in the Ohio Constitution, because right now the law basically says you can't use these data systems for things. The law per currently says, you know, that we have local control. Now those laws can be changed if, say, the Ohio House ever becomes a Democrat and governor flips. So the only way you can actually guarantee that is you change the Ohio Constitution. Well, uh, with respect to data, the administration changed the, the regulations so that, uh, so that private entities can receive student-level data. And the, the second thing, you know, I, I think we, we're, with respect to the idea that uh, we have a military, maybe that'll turn on the people or something, I think that gets back to the idea of the Constitution and the checks and balances that were, were in there and the underlying philosophy and that the federal government would have certain powers and duties and the state government would have certain powers and duties. And those checks and balances were, were put in there with a view as to what the functions of each of those governments would be. And the, the danger is when you start giving to the federal government or vice versa, duties that really belong to the state government. And that's that's what's happened here. And that's why it's a problem. All right, next is Susie, Susie Weaver of Worthington School District. Okay. Uh, Heather, you pointed out the dangers of the fuzzy math. And I wanted to ask about the dangers of the uh, fuzzy writing on page seven that the supporters of, of the Common Core point to as being more rigorous, saying, given a creative writing prompt, students produce a writing sample that uses mechanics, grammar, and conventions of writing that's scored against a predetermined rubric, which is a silly way of saying write. And I want to ask you also about the fact that when teachers are uh, mandated to teach to these tests, they are told to, add, to make the students read the questions first before they read the selection. And instead of reading with an open mind, say Shakespeare, and discovering layers of meaning, they, they read whatever the question, people who wrote, set the questions, think is important. And that is terribly dangerous. If you want to know more about the, looking at the literature that we would like with dark standards and comes part recommended to uh, look at Dr. Sandra Stotsky's work. Um, and she basically calls them empty skill sets. So what we know about literature is that it's important, like you mentioned, for children to read and think about and discuss that. Uh, and rubrics are helpful for kind of guiding discussion or knowing what is generally important to pull out. But it, is, it becomes less than helpful, like you mentioned, 
um, with teachers, that is what takes up all of their class time because they're fitting all of these different, you know, checks and, and uh, that they have to mark off on the boxes that they can't get to what the students are actually interested in. Depending on 
Independent School District, don't give me your, your child's social security number. That's not a recommended practice for school districts to collect that unless they need that for um, some other particular reason. But generally, educationally, school districts don't need the SSN, um, so it's safer data-wise if you don't provide that to the school. Um, and the second thing on the opt-out form, there actually is a common top core opt-out form online at truthinamericaneducation.com. So if you go there, print it out, and bring it to your school principal, your school can't actually opt out of common core because, well, they have to, you know, have the test, they have to do the state account, so on and so forth. But it's a great way to start a conversation. It's a great way to get your principal knowing that you're really concerned about this, um, and so on and so forth. It's just a one-page thing. You can download it free, you know, sign your name to it, and bring it in. What is that? What is that website? Truthinamericaneducation.com. Folks, I'm in New Albany. I drove here, I live the far side of New Albany, so it took me 25 minutes to get here. Um, you know, it's not far to go. We are implementing Common Core Math. It is resulting in some of our seventh graders taking algebra. That didn't happen before. We are moving it down. We're doing it as part of our district's effort to raise the performance of children. It is for your school board member in here, it is in your power to set higher standards than the common core. It is in your power to tell your superintendent to change the curriculum to raise it. If you have naysayers, fight back against them. That's why you got elected. That's why that's your job. I do my job and, and that that's your responsibility. All right, final questions from Carol Bicking of the Licking High School District. What would be the roadblocks involved with adopting the Massachusetts standards here in Ohio? If they're great, who or what would be against them? Uh, the governor is, in fact, that's what we tried to do last year. Um, we, our own roadblocks are actually with uh, many members within our party, but uh, the other side of the aisle just demagogued us and said that you're going to harm children and it's going to, you know, make them, you know, their self-esteem go away. I mean, we implemented last year the third grade reading guarantee here in Ohio. And the reason we did that is because we want to make sure that the students are able to read by the time they're in the third grade because they have to learn content after that. We were being told by the other side of the aisle that this was going to be a complete disaster for our schools, that the kids are going to be just, you know, it's going to be devastating. We're going to hold all these kids back. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to improve and, and, and go beyond that. One last comment on this side. Well, I'll say uh, this as, as Heather and Joy and, and Heather's um, uh, colleague in Hoosiers Against Common Core now, over the last year, there's uh, interest in repealing Common Core it is growing both among Democrats and Republicans. They have uh, Democrat sponsors um, in both the House and the Senate. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, so I would say bring it up again about if, if, if you want to bring Massachusetts standards in, bring the issue up again, and if, if uh, the other side of the aisle objects, you could refer them to President Obama's speech in March 2009 before the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, this is before the Common Core was written, where he said, I think every state should have standards like Massachusetts. She has a lot to say, so she gets the last word. This is her party. I want to tell you one more time on the back of your brochure, oblsc.org. Oh, oh, Please join. I want 200 memberships out of this fantastic forum. The second thing I want to say is, I'm an attorney. We appear in court, and the, the theory in our court system in America is an adversarial system. You have the pro, you have the con, and the judge decides. But you have to have that vigorous debate that gets you a good result. And I want to thank all of our panelists for presenting the time. Saturday, you feel passionately about one side or the other of this issue. 
I'm thanking for showing respect to our panelists. I want the, the brilliance we have up here gives me faith and hope in America that we can solve our problems, honestly. And I say this to people all the time. We do not have people in France marching in the streets for smaller government. Okay? We do have that in America. And we have wonderful people like this who are willing to give their time to make the system better. We have hope in this country. We have a lot of hope. It's fantastic. Give it to Kelly for the final word. Thank you all very much. all for coming. I thought they were awesome questions. They were to the point. They're exactly what we're all concerned about. Thank you for the answers. They were, they were great. They were on point. It sounds like we have a lot in common. The concerns from even the supporters are a match to the concerns of the, those opposed. And I have to say, school board, if I were ever to ask a question about curriculum, what I get is a nonstop barrage of you are not a curriculum expert. You have no business asking me anything about curriculum. So to ask a school board member that paid $125 per meeting, I make $250 a month, to all of a sudden become a curriculum expert and manage the curriculum is way too much to ask of your school board. It's nice to think that you can throw them under the bus. I am not doing it. That you can throw them under the bus and have them. I'm just going to talk to you. Um, to, to think that that would be one of their responsibilities, I think, is just insane. What we can do is hold people accountable. The difference between OSBLC and another organization, I'll just say, um, is that they don't encourage school board members to hold their school systems accountable. We do. And we coach them. He's talking about Adam White on the Nolan Tanji School Board. Right here, and I thank you for saying that because Adam White is on the board of OSBLC. He's just like me. But I'm telling you, I asked one question one time about curriculum. We got threatened by the ACLU and the Freedom from Religion. I was on the front page of the newspaper the next day. I asked one question about our curriculum, adopting one fifth grade science textbook, and that's what I got. So I don't think I think it's way too much to ask of us to get into the curriculum unless I can get you know sixty seventy thousand dollars a year and I'll get into the curriculum. But I'm not an expert. It's too much to ask. I can ask about our put scores. Ask why a lot of our students are getting proficient, and not above that. There's a whole lot of things school boards can do to hold their district accountable. Curriculum's not one of them. I'm just saying. Okay, so thank you guys for coming. I really need your support. OSBLC. Please don't want to become a member because our power with the legislators, and we have a whole team of us. Hey, team, stand up. We got board members in here from OSBLC. We got John. People are not going to listen to what we have to say at the state level until we have enough people listening to what we have to say. So help me out. We have a school board candidate workshop. It'll be our second for this year. If you're interested in running, June 22nd right here, you go to our website and it'll say, uh, um, let's see, activities or events. You click on that. June 22nd right here, we're going to hold a four-hour training. Uh, we already did one March 16th. We will hold another in, in August. And again, we're trying to make them as low cost as possible, so donations are always what helps us do that. But we want to start coaching school board members on how to hold their districts accountable. I have to tell you, success in Spring Grove, we had five failed levies. We had, um, I, I worked hard for that. And we had, um, we had a projected $30 million budget deficit that we turned into a $12 million surplus without any money. What? Our academic success is higher than it's ever been. So it didn't take money. It took a lot of That's what Thank you all for coming. Uh, this guy in the purple shirt or any table will accept your little card. <laughs> so leave that for us. We'd like to get to know where people are coming from for our events. Thank you very much.